I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Everything just goes wrong in my life. You're calling those things into being. Don't let words like that come out of your mouth. What you say is, I have the mind of Christ. I have the wisdom of God, James 1, 5, right? The Lord is instructing me. He's in teaching me. He's teaching me how to go, what to do. So let me ask the young people, you teenagers, do you really want to know God's plan for your life? First of all, do you believe God has a plan for your life? Amen. Do you want to know God's plan? If you do, then all you have to do is daily say, Father, thank you for revealing your plan to me. I'm standing on your word. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope so that your expectation will not be cut off. And then in Jeremiah 29, 13, he says, if you'll seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. Father, thank you for helping me to seek you. I will seek you daily. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. And he will reveal himself to you. And he will show you. And it just happens day by day by day by day by day. It's that simple, guys. Just daily seek him. Be in his word. Don't fabricate things. Just do what his word says. His word says, honor your parents. Honor your parents. His word says, give thanks and everything. Give thanks and everything. His word says, do not grumble or complain. Don't grumble or complain. Just do his word. And I guarantee you, Psalm, Chad, would you pull up Psalm 50, 23? See, when you do the word of God, what you read, when you do what you read, you can expect God to do his part. Whoever offers praise glorifies God. And to him who orders his conduct, his speech, his ways, his feet aright, I will show the salvation of God. That's a promise of God. If you and I will just order our steps aright, <clears throat> so you think, okay, the word of God says to give thanks in everything. So what do I have to do? Give thanks in everything. What am I doing? I'm ordering my steps aright, aren't I? Okay? The word says, honor your parents. What am I doing when I honor my parents? I'm ordering my steps aright. What does God say when I order my steps or my conduct aright? What will he do for me? He'll show me the salvation of God. He'll show me the way of God. He'll show me the healing power of God. He'll show me the delivering power of God. He'll show me all the provisions of God. He'll protect me and my family, right? All I have to do is just order my steps aright. Just do what I need to do. And Trevor, I don't know why, but it's like the Lord, he wants you to know that. He wants you to know that he is wanting to direct your steps. But if you, and I'm not, I don't know you that well, so I don't know what you're doing, but make sure you order your steps aright. And if you do, God's going to fulfill his promise. And for every other teenager in here, and don't ask me why God pulls one person out above another. I don't know. It's just that's where that person is today. But it's for everyone. It's not just for Trevor. It's for everyone. Order your steps aright and watch God work. Now, it's not just for teenagers, is it? It's for us. If we just order our steps aright, I know not to grumble or complain. So as I go through the day today, if I choose to grumble or complain, I'm not ordering my steps aright. And I cannot expect God to show me his path. But if I will order my steps aright, I can expect God to do his part. Amen? All right, what else did we hear the Lord say? Any, anything? Carrie? I got... Um just be humble, walking in humility, because when you're humble, you're teachable. Yeah. So there's no pride or any argument, of co you know, to the word of God. It's, okay, Father, I'm going to do what you say. Yes. Rather than say, why? 
Just be humble. Just say, yes, Lord. Right? Well, you don't know how much stuff I got to do. Just do what the Lord says. Just be humble. Just seek the Lord first and all of his righteousness. Right? When he says, you know, forgive this person. But you don't know what they did to me. Just forgive. Just be humble and say, yes, Lord, you're right. Help me to forgive them. I choose to forgive them. Right? I choose not to be offended. And that's humbling ourselves before God. It's giving up our will for his will is what it's doing. Okay? All right. Mike, do you want to come? Give Mike a warm welcome. Thanks, Joe. How's everybody doing? Doing good? All right. Praise the Lord. Welcome those that are watching via YouTube as well. Glad you've tuned in. Excited. We just got out of a great time of praise and worship, sitting before the Lord. And I'll go through these announcements. I think Chad's going to share his memory scripture. And then we'll see where the Lord leads the rest of the service. Amen. Aim's purpose, equip believers to be balanced word and spirit, motivated by love to fulfill the Great Commission, right? And one way we do that is this Blueprint for Life, the discipleship program. I, I encourage you, you're never too old, young, um, hairy, or bald to uh, go through this, right, Bruce? <laughs> but no, I just encourage you, you know, if you really want to walk with the Lord and really find out what his plan is, going through this will help you. Why? Because it references the Word of God throughout. You know, and that's how we find it. And it really orders everything very appropriately for you to truly learn how to walk with God and discover that plan he has for you. And it's specific for every single person. Amen. And so I encourage you to go through this. If you haven't, if you have, be praying for that person to mentor to take through this as well. And um, get with me, Chad, any of us, Joe, Gina, uh, Hannah, Carrie, you know, Bruce, all of us. If you want to go through this, we'll set you, set you up with a mentor. And um, I guarantee the Lord will reveal himself strongly to you through his word. Training and development, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. over at the Azusa House. So I encourage you to be there for that if you can. Some upcoming events. Men's meeting is this Saturday from 9 to 1030. So, man, be sure to mark that on your calendar. Um, and we'll have a great time of fellowship and also uh, diving into the Word of God. Amen. It's always a blessed time to see um, who shows up within the church, but then also outside of the church as well. And so I encourage you, man youth man as well. I bring my sons. Um, you're welcome to join us. And then Coffee Talk will be April 27th, the last Saturday of April from 9 to 1030. And here's the upcoming dates for the nursing home. Looks like we'll be going out to Bellevue this Wednesday. Here's the address. If you can make it, be sure to be there from 530 to 7. And then the uh, White House one will be at the end of the month. Interaction during service, you, if you have a scripture, testimony, question about the service and you're watching via YouTube, put it in the chat window. We'll try to cover that at the end of service. And then also get with me or Ben if you have a testimony or five-minute nugget that you want to share to the congregation, and uh, we'll make time for that, Lord willing. AIM Touch Points, text AIM Church to this number here, and you'll get a link to the stream before every service. Um, that way, if you're unable to attend, you can click on it pretty quickly and uh, be ready to uh, watch as the stream starts. Tools to witness and encourage others. We got the wristbands, the pamphlets, the 40 day 180 cards, the YouTube channel. Encourage you, you know, band up as some of us youth like to say, be putting these, you know, in your car ready to hand them out. But it's also a good reminder for yourself, you know, oh, I need to renew my mind. Where's my treasure today, you know? And so I encourage you to take some of these. They do cost money, but they're there for the taking for you to help yourself stay on the path he's called you to be on, but then also to hand out to those that you meet along the way. Y'all awake? Amen? All right. Chad's away. All right. Be praying for your family, church body, and leaders around the world. Be standing in the gap, right, declaring the solution and not how big the mountain is or how wrong so-and-so is. Be praying. You know, if you get that discernment on, man, I need to be praying for government leaders or whatever it may be, mayors, my boss at work, um, people in my family, you know, authority figures, whatever it may be, don't gossip about them, right? Stand in the gap for them and pray for them. Here's some scriptures to go along with that. I believe the Job 22:30 was shared earlier by Gina. Even the one whom is not innocent, whom you intercede for, will be saved by the cleanness of your hands. So it's critical that our prayers are being effective. And the way that they're most effective is if our own hands are pure and clean, right? So let's stand up. 
going to wake you up now. We're going to do jumping jacks as we say them today. No, I'm playing. <laughs> All right. Let's say this together. I choose to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and to offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Matthew 6.33 and Romans 12.1. I choose to seek peace and pursue it in every situation and choose to overcome evil by doing good. Psalm 34.14 and Romans 12.21. Do I have to do that all the time? Yeah, even on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, right? <laughs> Amen, 365. Thank you, Bruce. I choose to direct my footsteps according to your word and to keep sin from reigning in my heart. Psalm 119, 101, Psalm 119, 133. I thank you, Father, that by your son's stripes I am healed, and I take authority over all the power of the enemy so that he has no place in my life. Isaiah 53, 5 and Luke 10, 19. So here's the affirmations. Be declaring these every day. You know, and there's something specifically that you're battling, you know, stronghold, addiction, or something in your family or at work. Make that custom affirmation that, so that you're declaring it proactively. That way, when the enemy tries to come in like a flood, like Carrie mentioned, Isaiah 59, 19, you can reactively use that affirmation as well. And here you can download that on the website. And I would also have them in the back for those who are in person today. So options for tithing, we have the treasure chest in the back, the website, and the app. Not coercing you to tithe, but God's word calls us to tithe 10%. It's a joy to do that. He loves a cheerful giver, and no one here is paid. And so it's truly going to advance the kingdom of God to accomplish that plan he's called our ministry to do. Amen. And uh, I, I was thinking of this, I think, last week. The Lord reminded me of a testimony. And so um, when we were over at the uh, White House facility over there, and having church, you know, we had the youth event. I think it was called Ignited. And uh, the band Firefall, I think was the name of it, came over and uh, led worship. Well, the, the father of one of, uh, I think, the drummer and the bass player, and he also ran sound, John Harrington. Remember, we became pretty good friends and um, actually ended up speaking at another event that his son's band also led worship at. Well, we were talking during sound check, and um, his son, you know, is a drummer. And um, I was just sensing, man, or I was hearing his son talk about different symbols that he had wanted, and he didn't give any specific details. And I knew I had this uh, for drummers. You may not know what this is, but it's called a china, a Zildjian china trash. It's not a trash can. <laughs> but uh, it's almost like a, an upside-down symbol, and it makes this <laughs> sound instead of that <laughs> I know that makes perfect sense. But anyway... I had sensed, I loved this symbol. As a drummer, I loved this symbol. It was so unique, but I was like, you know what? That doesn't really flow with the worship. I probably need to get rid of this. And I asked him, I said, hey, I don't know what it is. I just sensed, can I, can I bless your son with this symbol? I mean, it cost 160 bucks, brand new, so it was expensive. And um, he said, yes, yeah, send me a picture of it when you get home. And so I get home, and I send him a picture of it. And um, I think he ends up calling me. He says, uh, you're not going to believe this. He said, my son was wanting to buy this symbol, but we've been teaching him to tithe. And I told him, if you tithe, God's going to bless you and supply all of your needs. So he'd been tithing, wanting this specific symbol, a, chi a Zildjian China trash 16-inch. And here I just come up to him. I don't know what it is, but I sense to give this to your son. And, I mean, I, I just can't imagine how much faith was built in his son, you know, through that. And so I gave it to him, and his son was ecstatic. And so it's not just with tithing, but it's in every area of our life. When we are faithful to obey God's word, get in it daily, hide it in our heart, and do it, he's going to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. I just I couldn't believe that, you know. And so I say that, too, when the Holy Spirit puts something in your spirit to do, even if it's like, oh, I don't know about this, you know, walk it out. Say, Lord, show me. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to approach this person and you never know um, how much faith you'll build in them by being obedient to what the Spirit shows you to do. Amen. Think of Joe's testimony to give his boss, I think, $10 or whatever. You know, and his, his boss, I think, made pretty good money. Why would I give him $10? For long story short, his boss had forgot his wallet and needed $10 to pay to get out of the parking garage, I guess. And so you never know, right, what, what the Lord's doing. And so be faithful and what he shows you to do, and you'll see what he does. Amen. It's a joy, especially when you see the fruit. Sometimes you may not get to see the fruit, but those times that you do, man, praise the Lord. Amen. All right, so let's go to this slide, and we'll say this together. 
because I obey God's word, I can expect that all my needs are met, all my bills are paid, I'm receiving jobs and better jobs, I'm receiving sales and commissions, I am gaining great interest and income, all my debt has been demolished, I'm receiving raises and bonuses, my benefits are increased, I'm receiving inheritances, I realize and receive rebates and returns, I have favor with everyone, I use all for God's plan and glory in my life. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so here's our 2024 memory scriptures. Man, already in April, so I encourage you, be picking one of these a month, hide it in your heart, and I guarantee the Lord will, um, you know, show you how to use it. It'll be a new tool in your tool belt to uh, really help you uh, stay on the path God's called you to be on and overcome the enemy. And so Chad, I think, is going to come and share his memory scripture for the month. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, my bald friend. Oh, I've got to say, I've got to break the ice. It, it's, uh, I feel the tension in here. Um, so it's actually proven that uh, bald men are better chefs. So it reminds me of a joke. A uh, man went to this fancy restaurant, and he ordered rabbit stew. He called the waitress over, and he complained to her, and he said, there's a hair in my soup. So, all right, I'm done. Need Mike over here to do. All right. So my memory scripture for the month is uh, Matthew 12, 36 and 37. So it says, but I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words, you'll be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. So this is pretty straightforward, but I want to just paint a different picture that the Lord was kind of explaining to me as I read this. Uh, a few weeks ago. So if you read this in context, passage starts at verse 33. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every, every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. So it's talking about the tree. It's talking about the fruit out of the abundance of the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So looking at some other scriptures, this is one that I bring out a lot, James 121. Get rid of all uncleanness and all that remains of wickedness, and with a humble spirit receive the word of God, which is implanted, actually rooted in your heart, which is able to save your souls. So as we just read, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We're to actually take God's word, plant it within our hearts, and then out of our heart, the word comes forth. Once it comes forth, Mark 4, 14, in the parable of the sower, Jesus said, the sower sows the word. The seed that we're planting in our lives is the words that we speak. It should be the word of God. It doesn't have to always be the word of God. You can speak negative things, and you're planting that in your garden, in your vineyard, and it will sprout. It will bring forth whatever it is that you're planting. So ultimately, the words that we speak are going into the garden. We all have a garden in our life, a spiritual garden that's going to bring forth good fruit or bad fruit, good tree, bad tree. So Matthew 7, 15 through 20, Jesus kind of reiterated this. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Wolves, as some people say. Uh, You will know them by their fruits. So he says this in verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Okay, read on. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Very similar to what he told us in Matthew. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. He just said this in verse 16. Now he's saying it again in verse 20. By their fruits you will know them. 
And you see in verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Every tree that does not bear good fruit does not go on to live in eternity with our Father in heaven. It's cut down and thrown into the fire. So we want to be bearing good fruit. We want to be a good tree. And by their fruits, you will know them. So Ephesians 5.1 says that we're to be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. God doesn't ask us to do anything that he himself does not do because we're to imitate him in everything that we do. So if he's telling us, by their fruits you will know them, he's going to do the same thing in our lives. He is going to know us by the fruits that we're producing, by what our garden is putting out. Is it fruitful or is it bearing bad fruit? So you can quickly look at someone at someone's life you can hear the words they're speaking you see what's going on in their life and tell if they're producing good fruit or bad fruit you don't have to know every every idle word so to speak that they're speaking you can just spend five minutes with them and know are they being fruitful or not so jesus here says by their fruits you will know them and he says it twice just uh, being transparent i myself was deceived many many years ago because Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So God may gift someone, and I'm going to just stray off here for just a minute because I could probably go the whole service on this, but God can gift someone in some certain area, and then they may walk in disobedience and not be fulfilling what God's called them to do. But God still gave them that gift. Thank you, Mike. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Many, many years ago, I ran into probably two different individuals that that had gifts they were gifted by God in areas and they moved in those gifts when they came to church and I admired them I respected them I was like wow these are mighty men of God but they weren't walking in obedience in every area of their life and their home life was not where it should be I knew them according to their gifts and what Jesus said here in Matthew 7 15 through 20 know them by their fruits so don't be don't be led astray by seeing some signs and wonders or great men or women of God moving in, in the gifts of God. Know them by their fruits is what he says. What does their garden look like? What does their home life look like? I'm not telling you to be fruit inspectors and go and judge everybody. Don't do that. Do it in your own life. Judge your own self. But God here is saying, know people by their fruits, not by their gifts. So what does their tree look like? What does their garden look like? So I think it's interesting to say this is Matthew 7, 15 through 20. The two little passages that are right around this I think are important, and I think you all probably know them. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. It's narrow. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And I just want to call out, there are many who go in by it. Many means more than the average. The majority of people are on that wide path that's leading to destruction. There are few who are on that narrow path. Okay, then he goes into, you shall know them by their fruits. And then after that, in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many, again, many, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Many years ago, as I was reading this, the Lord just had me to, to hone in on, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, and it just came to me, the non-believers, the people that aren't in church, aren't going to be calling him Lord. To him, they would just say God or however it is. They haven't made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of their life, so they're not going to be calling him Lord. But in this scripture, it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. This is talking about people in the church that believe they're following after God, that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're going to heaven but they're not being led of his spirit. They're not doing everything that God's told them to do, and their garden is not producing that good, fruitful tree. So many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And then he goes on to say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
you haven't been producing fruit, you're going to be cut off and thrown into the fire, uh, as is said in other scriptures. So, again, you shall know them by their fruits. We all have a garden. That garden is producing based on the words that you're speaking because the word is the seed, according to Mark 4.14. John 15, 1 through 8, Mike had this one as a memory scripture last year. He went on past 8, but I'll just go through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the words which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So if we're abiding in God, if we're abiding in his word, doing what he tells us to do, we're going to bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you're trying to do it outside of God, outside of his word, you're not going to be producing that fruitful garden that he wants you to. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. We prove to be disciples of Christ, the disciples of Jesus, if we're bearing that fruit. If we're not bearing that fruit, we're not proving ourselves to be disciples of Christ. So we have to make sure, again, that our garden is fruitful. It's bearing that fruit. If you think about this, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire. Scripture says that Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night. I've never done a poll, but I think if you did a poll and you asked all the people that have had their homes burglarized, none of them were expecting that thief to come that night. 100% of them. Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night, so we need to make sure that we're doing God's word today, that we're ready for when, when he comes back, that our garden is producing fruit, that we're sowing the right seed. Uh, so I would just encourage all of you to examine yourself in that. So scripture says that we will give an account of every idle word that we will speak on the day of judgment. But as, as we've just went through, the words that we speak are seeds. They go forth into that garden and they're going to sprout. They're either going to be a good tree or they're going to be a bad tree. Just going to show you in the natural sense how we can look at something and quickly determine what's been going on. So let's say it's harvest time. <coughs> Has the vine dresser here been doing everything that he's supposed to be doing, sowing the right seeds, watering those seeds, tilling and taking care of the garden? No. You don't have to have a video camera recording everything that that person has been doing. You know that he hasn't taken care of that garden. Same with this one. Did this person go out and plant seeds and do everything that he was supposed to be doing to yield a fruitful harvest? He broke up the ground, but he didn't plant seed. Yes, he tilled it. Now this one. Did this one do everything that they were supposed to be doing? Yes, you can quickly tell there's a fruitful harvest here. It's ready for the picking. Our lives should be like this. You should be able to quickly determine, yes, I am walking with the Lord. I'm doing everything that he's called me to do. I'm being led of his spirit, and I'm producing the fruit. So you can quickly tell which garden is fruitful. It's going to be the orange trees. I like this picture. It wasn't a real one, though, but you can... Uh, just tell, this is how our lives should be. We've got oranges, fruit, apples, watermelon. You've got everything there, and it's very fruitful. Our lives should be fruitful. You should be able to look and tell. And when you see someone and their lives are fruitful, you can know that they are speaking God's word because his word is seed, and it will produce everything that it was called forth to do. It shall not return void, as Isaiah 55 says. Okay, some other scriptures. I'm going to continue to hit on Mike's memory scriptures because they've spoken to me and they go along with this. Uh, Hosea 10, 14, sow for yourselves according to righteousness, uprightness and right standing with God. Reap according to mercy and loving kindness. Break up your uncultivated ground. 
for it is time to seek the Lord, to inquire of him and to require his favor till he comes and teaches you righteousness and rains his righteous gift of salvation upon you. You have plowed and plotted wickedness. You have reaped the willful injustice of oppressors. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own way and your chariots in the multitude of your mighty men. You can see both paths here. So one, in order for the implanted word of God to be within your heart, your heart can't be hardened. You've got to break up that fallow ground. So you need to examine your own lives and say, is my heart ready to receive the word of God? You need to humble yourself before him. You need to ask for forgiveness. If there's unforgiveness in your life, whatever it may be, break up that fallow ground so you can receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your souls. If you don't, you'll see at the end, you've plowed and plotted wickedness. Again, don't, don't let those ill, bad, uh, negative words come out of your mouth. You need to make sure that what you're speaking is life-giving and it lines up with God's word. Jeremiah 4.3, this is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. So again, make sure your heart is ready to receive everything that God has for you. Hebrews 6, 7, and 8, for ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces vegetation, useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Again, just trying to paint the picture that uh, the Lord uses gardening and, and the fruitful, fruitfulness of it or unfruitfulness of it uh, many, many times in Scripture. And then Galatians 6, 7 through 9, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So whatever you're sowing into that garden, that's what you're going to reap. If you're sowing God's promises, that's what you're going to reap. You're going to reap God's promises. If you're sowing negativity, if you're sowing doubt or fear or whatever it may be, that's what you're going to reap. Uh, if you get a bill in the mail and you say, oh my goodness, I don't have money to, to pay all of this. I don't have any money. You look at your bank account. I don't have any money. Well, that's what you're going to get. Declare God's word. Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that's what you will get. He will supply all of your needs. Uh, and as Job 22.28 says, as we declare his word, God's light will shine on our path. So we'll see how to get there. And then he will give us wisdom on how uh, all of our needs will be met. So for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Okay. Taking it to a natural sense, some people aren't going to like that I say this, but I believe it's going to paint a picture uh, to someone. Uh, at your jobs, at your work, your boss doesn't have to come to you at the end of the day with a video camera and go back through every single thing that you did that day. They can come to you and determine, did you do your job or did you not do your job? Yes, we will give account of every idle word that we say, but you can quickly look at that garden and tell, what have we been doing? Have we been doing God's will or not? So let's say that you pay someone to paint your house white. This is what your house looked like before, and contractor comes, he's coming to work, and then you come back at the end of the day, and your house looks like this. You can quickly tell, God did not paint my house. He didn't do it. But if you come home and your house looks like this, it's like, okay, he's done the work. You didn't sit there and micromanage every single thing that he did the whole day, but you can tell from the beginning and the end that, yes, he did the work. It's there. Now, I said some people aren't going to like this because they're not going to like that I'm saying that it's work, but God has given us the great commission that we are to go out and preach the gospel. He has told us to do that. And he will be able to quickly look at our lives and determine, are you doing that? Are you producing the fruit that I've called you to do and produce? Let's say you pay someone to build you a dog house. Well, you can come at the end of the day and tell if your dog's still running around the yard and there's no dog house or there's a dog house there. Again, you can quickly tell if he built it. I had, I had to put it on here because I'm like, wow, people actually put air conditioners on their dog houses. <laughs> Um, no judgment here. Um, I will say um, that's not very energy efficient, but um, 
You want? They, they need something. Um, okay, taking it away from work. Let's just say you ask your kids to do something. Let's say you ask your kids to clean their room. If the room looked like that on the left when you left, and it still looks like that when you get back, then they didn't clean their room. But if you get back and it looks like on the right, it's like, okay, they did something. I know they were being productive with their time. They cleaned their room. Say you ask your spouse to do the dishes. Well, you can tell if they've been done or not. Again, you didn't have to be there watching over every little thing that they did. You can tell if they were done or not. Say if you ask your spouse to clean the kitchen while you're gone. It's like you can <laughs> quickly tell. Um, I pray that your kitchens don't look like this. If they do, I would encourage you to go home and, and do some cleaning. But some are even worse. Uh, and then this one, it, uh, this next one made me wonder if it was actually real. But I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, examine yourself if your home looks like this. But I would encourage you to clean. But, again, the point is we will give an account of every idle word that we say. But you can quickly tell as you examine your lives and you examine the garden of your life, is it fruitful or is it not fruitful? You don't even have to know every single word that's been spoken. You can look at the end result and tell what's been going on there. We will still give an account of it, but ultimately, have we produced fruit? Because if we produce fruit, as John 15, 8 says, we will so prove to be disciples of Christ. Uh, so ultimately, I would just encourage all of you to examine your own lives, as uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, to determine, is my garden producing fruit or is it not producing fruit? And if it's not producing fruit, go back to the words that you're saying. Because the words that you're saying are the seeds that are being sowed into that garden. Are you doing God's word and speaking God's word? And if you are, you will produce a fruitful harvest with all of these fruit trees. And if you're not, it's going to look like these on the right where there's nothing to show for it. Uh, so, again, don't go around judging other people, but judge and examine yourself to determine whether you're producing fruit, whether you're speaking God's word and walking in obedience to his word. Uh, so that's my memory scripture. Um, Thank you, and I will hand it over to Joe. Thank you. What, uh, what are you taking away from what Chad shared with us? What's something that spoke? Carrie? At the mic? Uh, mic, mic, coming. The mic to Carrie, if we can. And then to Gina. So um, I think I've mentioned this before, but it goes back to you're pruned if you do, you're pruned if you don't. So you might as well make sure that you're pruned in the right way. So when you do give an account, you can say, okay, praise the Lord, I did what I was supposed to. But I also got, when I was looking at the, all the pictures, um, when you have good fruit, that can be contagious. Because people want that sweet-smelling aroma. They want to see the order. Yes. Even if they don't have it, by you walking in the light and doing what you're supposed to, I believe that makes that contagious energy for people to want to um, have that same thing. As, so it's, you're encouraging just by walking in the light. So yes. that kind of, to me, from the pictures. Amen. Yes. That discipline, that diligence. And then it affects other people, doesn't it? And see that scripture we shared earlier, Psalm 50, 23, order your steps aright, order your conduct aright, order your words aright, and then I will show you the salvation of God. And if we do that, then we, we will get the salvation of God, and then others will see God as well. Okay, Gina? So, um, John 15, 8, Chad, if you'll pull that up. And it says, and this is my Father glorified, that you will bring forth much fruit, and you will be my disciples. The Amplified says, thus proving yourselves to be disciples. Yeah. And so it's not about the gifts, because we all have gifts, but it is about producing the fruit. And as we produce the fruit, it's proof, not only to ourselves, but to those who look on, that we are his disciples. Yeah. And a, a fruit tree... As Chad showed, it's a byproduct of it being in good soil, isn't it? So you and I produce fruit because we're doing the right things, right? We're not even focused on the fruit. We're just focused on doing the word 
And when we do, what's it produce? Good fruit. All right. Hannah. I'm sure most of us know this, but just a reminder that that fruit is the fruit of the spirit. Yes. Galatians, Thank you. Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's the fruit that we should be bearing. Yes. But we will also bear more than that as well as we practice those. That's right. Because as we practice the fruit, you know, and so we've got love, joy, and peace. And I like to break them up like this with peace, kindness. Goodness, uh, kindness, patience. I'm missing one. Love, joy, peace, patience. And there's goodness, faithfulness. And actually, yeah. Because. See, really, this is the practice, the demonstration of the fruit. When you're patient, you're kind, you're good, walking in goodness, the heart, and gentle, then you actually are showing love, joy, and you have peace, right? When you, but in order to do this, you have to be faithful to the word, and you have to use self-control. You follow and when you do that, so if you would just focus on being patient, kind, have a good heart, do what's right, don't have any ill motives, and just be gentle, then you will be demonstrating the love of God. You'll have joy in your heart, and you'll have peace. But it takes being faithful to the Word of God and self-control. And if we do that, then we'll have this. And then to Hannah's point, that that fruit... When you do this, this is the fruit that people see. They see that love. They see the joy of the Lord. They see the peace that you have. And that you're able to show them the patience, the kindness, goodness, and gentleness. So, uh, practice that, as Chad was encouraging us. And remember, that's what we're to do. When we get together, we're to encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. I'm not going to be there when you stand before God, you're not going to be there when I stand before God. And so that's why we want to make sure that we're each practicing the word. Amen. What else? Uh, Julie? Um, one of the takeaways I got was speaking forth the word is going to produce that fruit in our life. And to be sure also that we're not tearing that back down with coming back in and speaking negative words after you've spoken word and spoken life. Don't for myself, don't come back, or everybody, don't come Amen. back and speak words of death or complaining after that. Yeah, because if, if I'm being patient, I'm not going to speak words of impatience, am I? If I'm being kind, I'm not going to speak unkindness. And so make sure that my words line up with the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. And if we do, then we will produce more fruit. If we don't, we will produce less fruit. And even the fruit we produce will not be effective. Okay. Mike? Chad, I think he's pulling up a scripture, but Proverbs 24, <coughs> 30, and 31 go along with, I guess, the garden you don't want. Um, I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all grown, overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. And so sitting back there reading that last part, the wall, you know, I, I believe that's, you're using that discernment to know who do I need to allow into my life, into my garden, and who not. And when that wall is broken down, you're just befriending everyone and allowing everything in there, and it's just taking over. It's the First Corinthians 15.33, bad character corrupts good morals. And yes. so others could come in there and start sowing thorns and different things if you're not keeping that wall up and guarded and using the discernment. Yes, absolutely. And so you think about what it's saying here is that it's the discipline, isn't it? And where does this, 
so for all of us, but specifically for the young people here, um, if when I get home from school, when you get home from school, or school day ends, and you're going to go out and you're going you're gonna to play, you're going to do work, whatever, you put your work clothes on, you put your play clothes on, and so you take your clothes off and you just drop them on the floor. Is that discipline? No, what is that? It's, it could leads to chaos. It's laziness, isn't it? See, this, we're, this is where the rubber meets the road, is that it starts with you and me in everything that we do, right? Chad had it, the kitchen. When you, when, when you finish dinner, if everybody helps to clean up, it makes the work light. It makes it easy. And so does everybody take their dishes to the sink? I don't know how you do it in your own house, but you need to establish order to make sure you do. Because if you let people get up from the table in the family and they don't help, you're not teaching them. But when you say, okay, guys, let's take everything to the sink, let's, let's everybody help, and let's get this work done. See, not only are we teaching people to discipline themselves to work, but we're getting things done quicker, aren't we? And we're using our time wisely, and God blesses. So you have to decide in your own home, but the thing is, the principles are the same. And if you don't practice these principles, it, you're going to have chaos, potentially, in your house. Um, Chad, as you were uh, sharing with us, can I Go, say one more thing? Sure. I was thinking as you were just saying that, I was thinking before to say that Matthew 6, 33, and you've said this before, seek first the kingdom uh, of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And you've said before, he says seek first, not seek, seek only. I, if you get done with everything that you have to do, then go and play a game, go play outside, but get done your responsibilities first. Uh, some people have this misconception that walking with God is, is in your Bible all day, every day. It's like, no, do what God's told you to do, and then give yourself a break. With, with work, like Wayne, for example, he's got to deliver mail from one place to the other place. His work's not going to get him if he stops at the gas station and gets a chocolate milk or something. You know, give yourself a reward. Give yourself a treat. Sit down and do that, but seek first the Lord and his righteousness. Do, do what you know to do first. Discipline yourself to get those things done, and then not only can you reap the enjoyment of it being done, you'll have the peace, and then whenever you go to do whatever it is that you want to do, play a game or play outside, whatever, you can do that with peace and joy, knowing that your responsibilities are done. Amen. Yeah, and to, to your point, I can remember back in growing up, the youngest of seven kids, and if my parents had to go run an errand, and they left, um, they left one of the older ones in charge, and they said, okay, I want you guys to do these things while we're gone. Many times, well, I won't say many, sometimes. Sometimes we would go play first. But even while you were playing, what was your mind on? I got to do this. I hope mom and daddy don't come back. <laughs> right? And so you can't even enjoy what Chad was saying. You can't even enjoy. Just do your work first. And then enjoy, right? Um, why don't you pull up um, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And I think you may have even brought this out. But, you know, everything that we do, do it heartily unto the Lord, right? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you do the word of God, your labor is not in vain. When you honor the parents, when you discipline yourself to do the things that adults and, and teenagers and, ch and children, when we discipline ourselves to do the things that we should, we get rewarded and God blesses. Amen? Uh, would you pull up uh, Proverbs 12, 24? I'm just reiterating the things that Chad shared with us. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Not that you want to rule, but it means you will prosper. See, 
Many people think that serving God, God's just going to give you everything on a platter. No, he's not. He's already outlined the way that you and I can prosper. He's already outlined the way that you and I have effective prayers. He's also outlined how you and I get healed. He's also outlined how you and I get saved. He has everything all laid out. But if all we have to do is do discipline, exhibit discipline, and do what his word says. And when we do, we're the ones that will be blessed. One more. Um, if we could look up Philippians 2, 14 and 15. And this is a warning that while you're doing the discipline, do all things without complaining and disputing or grumbling, right? Well, I got the dishes done, but how, many, how much grumbling and complaining did you do, right? I mowed the yard, but how much grumbling and complaining did I do? And so don't do that. And then let's go to 15. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, the Father wants us to shine for, he wants us to be blessed, number one. It is his desire for his children to be blessed. That's a good daddy, to want you to be blessed. See, don't be careful about listening to all this stuff out there that God doesn't want to bless you. Yes, he does. He doesn't want you seeking the blessings. He wants you seeking him. And when you seek him, the blessings will come, right? It's like when you work hard, you're going to get blessed. If you don't work, you're not going to get blessed. When you seek the Lord, it, the blessings come. So seek him. Julie? It came to my mind when you were talking about that when you're doing the dishes, don't grumble and complain about the lady that didn't like doing the dishes, and then she started praying for her family members. So yeah. Yeah, she, you know, she did Julie's point. I read this uh, about a lady one time. She hated to do dishes. And when the family, they finished uh, breakfast, they run off to, had to get to school. So she was left with a bunch of big, a bunch of dishes, and she had a large family. And <clears throat> so she would go to the Lord, and I just hate doing dishes. And one day, the Lord shared with her, and when she sought him and asking for wisdom, wisdom humbling herself, right? She said, Lord, how can I change this? And he said, why don't you just pray for them? Each dish you wash, pray for that person who ate on that dish that day. And that's what she started doing. And then she couldn't wait to do the dishes. And she said it was amazing how quickly the dishes went. Because her focus now was on praying for people, not the grumbling and the complaining. And see, that's what the Father wants to do for us. He wants us to have a different mindset about life, that his, his plan is good. And if we seek him, we'll know that plan. Amen? Which is where we're going to go today, um, not where I was planning on going. But let me just ask a few questions. We'll look at some scriptures, um, and then we'll, we'll go to the board. So how can I know the plan of God for my life? How can I know that? So Bruce said, in the word. So give me, a, give me a scripture. How can I know God's plan for my life? Okay, Joshua 1.8. Let's, let's start even deeper, okay, or higher. What does Psalm 119.105 say? Yep. All right, Chad, would you put that up? So Bruce said the word. So his word is a lamp and a light, Right? Okay, so your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So if we were to think of you walking on this path, you got on this path through Jesus Christ, you accepted him as your savior, you got on this path, you're starting to walk on this path. The word, right, Psalm 119, 105, that's right, one and 130, that you're, the word of God is your lamp and your light 
to walk on this path. And so you begin to walk on that path. Now, Lynn, would you pull up 132, Chad? So we see here that the entrance of his word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So if you and I will get into the word of God, it will give us understanding. It'll, it'll open up. It'll give light to our life. It'll help us to see what's important in our life. Now, so the question was, how can I... How can I know God's will? And so it came forth that it's the Word. Primarily, it's the Word of God. We know also the Holy Spirit's available, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So we get on this path, and we begin to walk. The Word is our lamp and our light, right? Okay, what can I expect from the Word of God? When it says lamp and light, what can I expect Him to show me? Can, and let me lead you a little bit. So, can I expect Him to show me how to live? Yeah. What does that mean, how to live? Well, so, my conduct... Right? My behavior. So that's what you can expect from God. That his lamp and his light will show you how to live. The conduct, the behavior, the words, as Chad was saying. The words to speak. Right? That's what his word does for us. It's that simple. But if I don't ever get into his word, how am I going to live? What am I going to get my learning from? The world. And does the world know how to live? In their own way, they do, don't they? But the ways of the world bring death and destruction. The ways of God bring what? Life and life abundantly. How do we know that? John 15, 7, right? Well, John 10, 10, sorry. That the enemy... The ways of the enemy is to steal, kill, and to destroy, but the way of God is to bring life and life abundantly. Thank you, Chad. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So you and I, as we seek the Lord the, through the word of God, we know how to live, right? And so let's say that from the time I'm born until the time I graduate high school, I, I, my parents teach me how to get into the Word of God, and I start to have a daily devotion. I start to read the Word of God, and I start to apply it. Give me some examples of some of the commands that God gives us as, ch as children, as teenagers. We said one earlier. What is it? And let's... Let's let, the, let's let the young people answer, okay? So, who's going to answer? What is one thing that the Word tells us? Obey your parents, right? Chad, would you pull up Ephesians 6, 2, and 3? Now, if I am a young person, if I'm the age of Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ann or Corinne, if, if I'm their age, and it says, honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with promise. Look what it says next. That it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. That if you and I will honor our parents, everything will be well with us. And we will live long upon the earth. Right? Now, let's say I'm beyond, I'm getting ready to graduate high school. And I want to know what God's will is for my life. Right? I want to know what he wants me to do. Can I trust his word to lead me? Yes. How, where does he tell me that? Where does he tell me I can trust him? That he will instruct me. He will teach me. Is that, uh, yeah, Psalm 32, 8. Close. Yep. So now, what do I do? 
in life. Right? And so now, where do I work? Where do I live? Uh, where do, who do I marry? So Psalm 32, 8, would you put that up, Chad? He did. Thank you. So we have a promise from God that he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. So that's a promise, isn't it? That you and I can trust him. That we can know that God will lead us. And where does it come? From the word, doesn't it? It comes from the word and a combination of the Holy Spirit. But what does the Holy Spirit use? The word of God. And so we see that it's so important that if we're going to get God's plan for our life, that we have to be in the word of God. And then we have to be open to the Holy Spirit leading us. Does the Holy Spirit ever lead contrary to the word of God? Never. He never leads contrary to the word of God. See, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son, Jesus, and, and God the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all one. They're in unity, and they all speak the same thing. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit leads us, he leads us with the word of God. How can we know that? Would you pull up Psalm 33, 4? So we see that the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done where? In truth. So all of his work is done in truth. We know this. It's, it's just encouraging us all the more to make sure we're in the word of God. So all of his work is done in truth. Yeah, but that doesn't say it's the word of God. So what do we have to do? We have to rightly divide the word, don't we? Chad, would you pull up John 17, 17? And see, we see here in John 17, 17, Jesus tells us what truth is. Sanctify them by your truth. What? Your word is truth. And so we see that his word is truth. Now, where does he do, if you don't mind to go back to Psalm 33, 4, where does he do all of his work? In his truth, in his word, doesn't he? So if you want to know how to live, where do you have to go? The word. If you want to know what to do in life, where do you have to go? The word. See, if you and I will go back to the word and, and stay in it, and as Chad said, this is very important, that you don't have to spend all day in the word. You set aside 30 minutes. You set aside an hour, whatever the time that you have. You set a time aside to spend in the Lord's Word daily, and you get there daily. I attended a seminar one time, and this person was talking about becoming an expert. The, the studies show if you want to become an expert in raising tulips, right? Do you know how much, ti you know how much time a day and how many years it will take you to become the expert? Ten minutes a day for one year. People will recognize you as the expert. Why? Because you're getting new information every single day. And you're learning it. And you're learning it. Before long, what are you doing when you learn it? You're speaking it. You're sharing it. People say, hey, there's the expert. There's the expert over there. Right? Now, what adds to the learning is what? The actual doing. So make sure you have a garden to plant your tulips in, right? Because then you can practice what you're learning. And if you do that, you will become the expert. I promise you, if you will spend 10 minutes a day in the Word of God, hiding the Word of God in your heart, you will be amazed and shocked at what your life will be one year from now. It will be drastically different. And it will be drastically different in a positive way. Amen? And see, but where does he do all of his work? In his word. Why do you think the enemy wants to keep you and me out of his word? 
Keep you powerless. Keep you powerless, deceive us, right? And if he can do that, because then we will believe that it's some other way that we, we're going to find God's will, right? So, Carrie, sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, could you add to um, the scriptures we were talking about, John 17, 17, and Psalms 33, 4, is Psalms 119, 160, the sum of God's word is truth. Absolutely, yeah. Do you have mind to pull that up? See, it's the sum of God's word that's truth. You can't take one scripture, you've got to rightly divide it, right? The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances, your promises, your principles is everlasting. Amen? Another scripture is John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will lead us in all truth. And he will guide us. So, John 16, 13. Yeah, and, and that one is how the Holy Spirit uses the word to guide us, doesn't he? And so, you're absolutely right. So, Chad? Yeah, in line with Carrie's comment on Psalm 119, 160, the sum of your word is truth. When you started talking about Psalm 119, 105, that your word is a lamp under my feet, a light into my path. I've always envisioned this as an actual lamp, and it's shining. And if you're in a dark room and you see a treasure chest or whatever it is, you shine the light all around, and you find it, and then you walk towards it. But as you were talking, I truly see it, saw it as a road and like traffic lights or an actual sign that your word is a, is a light, and it will actually tell us. It doesn't have to just be a incandescent yellow or white light it, it's going to be different colors it will be red where he'll say rest and wait patiently in me it, it'll be yellow to proceed with caution it will tell you to turn around or whatever it may be but uh, again to carrie's comment the sum of your word is truth if you think of these directions if you're going down a road and you're trying to drive from here to florida or wherever it may be and in the old days of printing out map quest directions or whatever if you follow the first five directions, but then you miss one, you don't get there. Yeah. And you've got to follow all of those directions. The sum of your word is truth. If you just follow nine out of ten directions, you're not going to get there. Yes. Uh, and the sum of it, that's why we have to just obedient, be obedient to, to everything that's there uh, to truly walk in that truth. Amen. So daily examine ourselves to see if we're following everything that we know to do in the word of God right? I don't care how new or how old we are. As we're walking on this path and we're daily in the Word, when, to Chad's point, if, the, if a red light's there, if the Spirit of the Lord, and we're going to talk more about that because it's going to lead us right into where I believe the Lord wanted us to go, is that if there's a red light, there's a caution light, you've got to stop. You've got to slow down and you've got to say, yes, Lord, what are you trying to show me here? You can't keep going if there's, if there's these stoplights along the way. Amen? Now, let's look at one more before we go the other direction. Joshua 1.8, the one Gina brought out. So, we know that not only is God telling us that this is his lamp and his light, but he's telling us if you'll follow it, he gives us a promise, doesn't he? Look what he says. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So he promises that. Okay. Now there will be those people who tell you, you cannot claim this promise. This was to Joshua. You know, this isn't to you. That isn't true. He's no respecter of persons. He does all of his work in his word, right? And so you and I can trust him. When you look at when Jesus quoted scriptures, when Jesus quoted scriptures, did he quote a whole chapter? No, he didn't. He pulled scriptures out of context, didn't he? So go tell Jesus he can't pull them out of context, right? Right? Go tell Jesus he did it wrong. See, all the promises of God are yes and amen. The same promise he gave to Joshua 
He has given to you and me. He's no respecter of persons. Now, you and I just must do what the Word says. And if we do, we can reap the benefits of it. Okay? Carrie and then Gina. So, I just had this conversation with someone a couple of days ago because um, they would like to say, well, like you said, that, that was for so-and-so. That was for Job. That was for... And I said, no. I said, it might be if you read it as a history book. I said, but I read the Bible. It's, it's my power tool. Yeah. And, you know, the scripture that says Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. To me, that says what he wrote them, he wrote to me as well. And am I going to read it as, oh, that's just for them. I don't really have to do it because I'm going to justify myself and my ways out of it. Or am I going to say, no, this is God's word. He's speaking to me, and I better be doing what he says. So when the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, it would be great for me. But it's going to be terrible for the ones that try to justify their means of, that was a history book. Yeah. And I like what you said. If you read it as a history book, you're right. It was written to them. But it's not a history book. It's a living book. It's a living word of God. Amen. Gina? Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 goes along with that. Where it says, for all scripture. Well, Chad, if you'll pull that up, please. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for our doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's all scripture. We can learn from yes. all the scripture that he's given. Amen? Amen. And, and that's actually where we are wanting to go was to Second Corinthians or Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Because what I want you to do, we say the word of God is our lamp and our light. And so when we look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, if you'll put it up again, Chad. And let's, let's explore this. Let's dissect it. So it is for what? What's the first thing it's for? For doctrine. And so it's all, as Gina pointed out, <clears throat> all Scripture, not part, not the book of Joshua, not the Gospel of Matthew, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, okay? So the first thing that you can use it for is doctrine. What's another word for doctrine? Your beliefs, right? So what are your beliefs? Now, let me ask you, if you and I are reading the same Bible and we're listening to the same Holy Spirit, are our beliefs going to be the same? Yeah, they are. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't tell this person one thing and this person another. Everything that is foundational in the Scripture. Now, the Holy Spirit can use the Word of God to lead me differently, but not my belief. Okay? Let me give you an example. So, years ago, I was invited to, 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 uh, to go to a meeting and, and present some information. And I didn't want to go. And I said, Lord, I will go if you want me to go. And I left it. I just rolled it up on the, up on the Lord. Proverbs 16, 3 says, roll your works up on the Lord. He will establish your thinking. So I rolled it up on him. I get up. I go to get dressed. I'm looking in the mirror, shaving, and the Lord speaks to me, Psalm 105, 17. Would you pull up Psalm 105, 17? See, this is where we sometimes get a little confused. Well, I think differently from you. No. Look what it says. What did I just pray? Lord, is it your will for me to go? Do you see how God used this scripture to lead me? He sent a man before them. Even Joseph. Okay. What was he telling me? Go. Joe, go. Now, is that what that scripture means? No. For my situation that day, it was. You follow me? But, you, but that's because God used that scripture to lead me to do something that he wanted me to do. It does not mean anything different for me doctrinally than it does for you. Right? It's just telling about Joseph. He just happened to use it to lead me. You follow me? Okay, 
So you and I should always be believing the Word of God. And if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit. He doesn't tell one person one thing and another person another thing. But he can use the Word to lead us differently. All right, what's the next one? Reproof. Okay, and then what? Correction. And then instruction in righteousness. Now, what if I accept Christ as my Savior and I don't get into the Word of God? Yeah, am I really following? But, but I, here's one thing I do. I've got a radio, and I turn the radio on, and I follow a lot of other people. So am I following God or who am I following? I'm following whoever I'm listening to. If, they're, if they are right, then I'm okay. But what if they're not right? I'll have no solid doctrine. And I'll do nothing but other than what Jim, Jack, and Jill told me to do, right? And so that's why the Word of God is so important because it will develop your beliefs and if you're belie if you're listening to the holy spirit and you're rightly dividing the word of truth every believer's doctrine will be in line with the word of god okay reproof so, uh carrie i'm sorry i was just gonna say the holy spirit just gave me um if you're not in the word how are you going to know who you're listening to is speaking the truth of the word yeah. You won't know, and so you've opened yourself up to deception. Yeah, so even if they're speaking the truth, I won't even know it, will I? Because I'm not in the Word. And see, that's why you and I need to be in the Word. That's why God gave us the Word, so that we could develop and know the beliefs, the doctrine that He wants us to have. Chad? I just felt impressed to say, uh, as was brought up, earlier with Matthew 7, 13, and 14, it's a narrow path. So majority of people in this world are not going to be believing according to what God's Word and His Holy Spirit is directing us to, to walk in. And in line with that, Scripture says that we're going to face persecutions, and a lot of that is because we're not going along with the crowd. So you can have friends at school or wherever it may be that want to go one direction and they may persecute you for the way that you believe or whatever it may be, but they're not going to be standing with you at the end. You're going to be before God, and he's going to be the one that's judging you if you've done his word or not. So just encourage you in that to not go along with the crowd. Amen. Amen. And this goes back to what you were saying earlier with the path, and on this path, his word is our lamp and our light. His, there, are, there are red lights along the way, aren't there? There's caution lights. That's reproof. That's saying, hey, stop. You're not going the right direction here. It's just, and so we need to listen to him, right? And the more we will listen, the greater discernment, the more word we get in us and we listen, the greater discernment we will have. And as long as we, we are open to his reproof, his correction, he will instruct us in the path of life. A man in righteousness. That's right. We will have the mind of Christ. Any other thoughts on this? See, it is so key, and I pray what all of us walk away with, the power of the Word of God. If you and I do not get into the Word of God, if we don't consistently, daily, seek first God's Word, we will not have the beliefs that will get you to where you need to go, to heaven. You will be on the, on the wide road and not the narrow road. Because Jesus warned us very carefully, the road to heaven is very narrow. The road to hell is very wide. And you could say it this way, the road to hell, the beliefs are wide, right? The road to heaven, the beliefs are very narrow. They're according to the word of God. And if you're not in the Word, you won't get any of that. The correction, the warnings, the reproof. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So to Julie's point, 
unless you're in the Word, you're not going to get any reproof or correction or instruction. Because what does the Holy Spirit use? The Word. So the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God. So John 16, 13, that was brought up earlier. The Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will lead you into all truth. And then uh, Ephesians six seventeen, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, right? And so He uses the Word of God to teach us, to correct us, to instruct us. But if you and I are not in the Word of God, you will be deceived, as Chad brought out. In the last days, many false prophets will arise. Those false prophets will teach you things outside of the Word of God. And you will not know, to Carrie's point, you will not know if these things are in the Word or not, if you're not in the Word yourself. Okay, Gina? And you can add to that Hebrews 4.12. Yes. Amen. Because the Word of God is quick, it's powerful. It will correct us. It will lead us. It will warn us. It'll do everything that God intended it to do. Which that's why I love Psalm 33, 4. He does all of his work in his word. That's where he does it. And if you and I are not in his word, he can't do his work. Okay? I want you to stop for about 20 seconds. I want you to think, what is it today that I'm going to apply to my life this coming week? Maybe it's hide one of these scriptures in your, in your heart, in your mind. Maybe it's repent and say, you know what? I haven't been getting into the word daily, and I'm going to from this day forward. I'm not going to allow the enemy to deceive me. I'm going to keep my eyes focused upon the word of God. But what are you going to do differently? And I promise you, young people, all of you, they, the Lord will lead you. He will guide you. But you've got to do your part. If you will start seeking him daily, just start in the Gospel of John. Read one chapter a day and just say, Father, I want to know your will for my life. I want to follow you. <clears throat> and I guarantee you, then if you'll get into the word, he will lead you. He will guide you. And you will start to see un and understand who he is and what he wants to do in your life. Amen? All right. Mike, would you come? Or Chad? Then Mike, would you come? Yeah, I just wanted to share one thing with the... Uh 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, since all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for all these things, even more reason that we need to hide the word in our heart and something that Gina had shared with me many, many years ago with this scripture, you know, find, find whatever works for you to memorize it. But one of the things that she had said to me was Dr. Circus. So every time I see this scripture, I think of Dr. Circus. So it's profitable for doctor in the D, reproof the R, so doctor, and then circus, C-I-R, correction, instruction, and righteousness. But w whatever works for you, find ways to memorize scripture, whether it's through repetition, writing it over and over again, putting it as a lock screen on your phone. We've had people that sing it, you know, whatever works for you. Um, I know the Lord had me memorize uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, just numerically, so it's rejoice always is two words. Uh, rejoice always, uh, pray without ceasing is three words, and everything give thanks is four words. So <laughs> I put it in order, two, three, four. That, that's how it goes in the scripture. But, you know, just meditate upon the word, find what works for you to memorize it, because it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction and in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So... Have Amen. a memory plan, whatever it is, to memorize the scripture and do what works for you. Yes. And if you know that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, goes down into the dividing of soul and, of soul and spirit, into the joints and the marrow, and it helps us to discern what's right and what's wrong, why would we not hide the word of God in our heart? Right? To help us to live the life on earth that he's given us. And then when we're finished here on earth, we're going to go to be with him, right? One other scripture. Chad, would you pull up John 12, 47 and 48? See, why do we need to do this? Here's the warning. Because it's going to be the word of God that you're going to have to answer to. 
You're not going to answer to me. You're going to answer to the word of God. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Look what he says next. He who rejects me, my word, and does not receive my words, has that which will judge him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. See, every one of us are going to stand before God. We are going to give an account of our life. Start today making the right choices, the right decisions. All we have to do is repent and say, Father, I'm sorry. I've been running my own life. I've been doing what I wanted. I ask you to forgive me. I now understand why Jesus Christ came. He came to forgive me of my sins. He came to show me the way to put me on the right path. And so I accept him as my Savior. I choose to start following him today. Father, fill me up with your Holy Ghost. Fill me up with the wisdom of God. I will do my part. I will get into the Word daily. And then you do your part. You're going to teach me. That's all you have to do, guys. It's that simple. Amen? All right, Mike, would you come? Amen. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Chad, as well. Amen. Um, Chad, can you go to Luke 18, 8? I know a lot of us know this story. We share this story a lot about the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow, but I think this is what we need to ask ourselves. So I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth, right? And so is he going to find our gardens full of fruit, or is he going to find them just overgrown with weeds, no fence, no con- self-control, no fruit of the Spirit in our lives, right? And how does faith increase in our lives? Yeah, Romans ten seventeen, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so if I want to increase my faith, increase my growth, I've got to get in the Word of God, and then it's going to increase. But then I've got to be quick to do it, right? Hide it in my heart, quick to do it, speak it out of my mouth. And um, I know a lot of the focus seems like it's been on the youth, but I love uh, one of my favorite scriptures is uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in faith, love, speech, conduct, and purity. And so you set that example. And it, it could be young can also relate to age, but I think it can also relate to, hey, maybe you're a new believer in Christ, right? Set that example. Don't let it, let anyone look down on you. Well, you this is the way you've always been. Who do you think you are trying to be all God-fearing and everything, right? Don't let them look down on you. Just keep plowing that field. Keep setting that example for the believers in faith, love, speech, conduct, and purity. And those seeds are going to grow, amen? That fruit is going to continue to flourish in your garden. And it's it's worth it. And I love, Chad, can you go to Matthew? I think it's 1929. This is one I read this week, this just reaffirms and reassures us how much it's worth it, right? Because it's going to cost us things, right? If we're really in this daily, guess what? He's going to show us, oh, Mike, you need to get rid of that. Oh, you need to let go of that friendship. You need to create some separation there. So, But it's, like I said, worth it. And every, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, for his word, right, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And so it's probably going to show us to give up something, but when we do that, it's worth it. We're going to receive a hundredfold, amen? Anything that we give up for God on this earth doesn't compare to that glory that will be revealed when we get up there. And he says, hey, I showed you to do this, and you did it, amen? And one other thing, it's interesting, I think it was, yeah, it was this morning. I love how the Lord interconnects everything. The Lord was just showing me to uh, encourage us all to be watchful and praying for the Lord is going to come back like a thief in the night. And that's what Chad had shared. And so I literally got here at 830 and was writing these verses down. I just love how it all interconnects. So, Chad, do you mind going to, uh, I'm going to re- read maybe four or five, Luke 21, 34 through 36, real quick. Like I said, this was 8.30 this morning. I had no idea what was going to be covered today, and so I just, I love this. <coughs> Made the t- same thing this morning. I wasn't planning on saying that. So, <laughs> Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. It's the Holy Spirit, right? If we're all in his word, he's, all gonna, he's always going to interconnect everything and align us to receive what he has for us. 
But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And then 36, watch therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, right? And so we've got to be watchful at all times. And then some in Revelation as well, Chad, Revelation 22, um, 12 through 15. This once again shows it's worth it, but then it also gives that caution and warning. If we're not about his business, you know, what's going to happen. And behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work, right? I know works don't save us, but works show the evidence of who we've been saved by, right? Uh, 13, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commands that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices a lie. And so anything that's contrary to this, guess what? Is it a lie? Yeah, it's false. And so make sure we're practicing his word. Another one, Chad, Revelation 21, 7 through 8. Thank you. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So he who what? Overcomes, right, with the word of God. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's the scripture that Chad talked about in uh, John John 15, 6. You know, those branches are cut off and thrown into the fire, you know. And so just want to not cause fear, but, you know, be truthful and, and, and honest with you. It's It's life or death, blessings or cursings, and we all have that choice and make that choice to live for life, right? Live for the Word of God so that you'll prosper in that day when He comes or we go to meet with Him, we can say, hey, I know Him. I've been doing your Word, right? And I like what Chad brought out about the gifts. Don't seek the gifts. Yeah, there may be someone that speaks eloquently and all they are able to just, you know, perform all these signs and wonders, you've got to use that discernment with the word, like Carrie had mentioned as well, you know, if we don't have this in us, we're not going to have that discernment. In Revelation 12, 11, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, right? And then one more Psalm 127, 1, um, unless the builders, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. And so I just question us all, what house are we building in our lives? Am I all about me? Am I all about my business? As much money can I get? How big of a house can I get? What new car can I get? Or am I building God's house that he's calling me to build, right? Am I doing the things he's calling me to do? Amen. And we will receive that reward. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? This has been a been a good day. Psalm 8411, Chad, yeah. Seek the kingdom first. Yeah, Matthew 6.33. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from those whose walk is uprightly. Amen. And so we live uprightly by this. We keep doing all we know to do. We don't have to do all that's in there. I've just got to continue to grow in my knowledge and my learning and continue to do all that I've learned, and I'm going to be right where he wants me to be. Amen. Draw close to God. He'll draw close to me. God is his word, John 1, 1. When we do that, it doesn't matter what I've done. I repent. Those times of refreshing come. He casts that sin as far as the east is from the west. No more to be remembered, right? And don't go back to it, right? Don't go back to it. Throw it, burn it, destroy it, whatever you got to do, and uh, the Lord will reward you for everything that we're doing for him. It's not in vain. It's the uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight that uh, Joe had shared earlier, you know. Stand firm, my dear brothers, immovable. Let nothing move you. Always devote yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, which is probably in this, right? It is the word of God, and your labor is not in vain. That goes along with the Psalm 127.1 as well. I never connected those together like that, but praise the Lord. All right, anything else? You feel inspired, encouraged?
motivated by love to fulfill the Great Commission? <laughs> nah, you feel armed, right? When we walk out of here, that's when the testing comes, right? I, it could be as soon as I get in my car and pull out when I'm driving down the road or I walk into the house, you know, or I go to lunch or whatever it may be. That's when that testing comes. And so be faithful. Like it said in Matthew 19, 29, it's worth it. Anything we give up for him, whether it's my own pride, right? A lot of times it's, you know what? I'm just going to let Lot choose here. Let, let go of that, right? <laughs> and uh, you will be rewarded. Amen? Amen. All right. Romans 8, 18. I'm convinced that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed through his spirit. Amen? All right. I'll close us in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the reminder, Lord, to be watchful, to be um, those faithful as the parable of the ten virgins, Lord. Have our oil, our lamps full of oil, Lord. Our light shining bright at all times, Lord. Full of your word, Lord. Being faithful handlers and doers of your word, Lord, so that that light will continue to shine bright. So that on that day when you come back, Lord, you'll find us with our lamps full of oil our light shining brightly for you, glorifying you, Lord. And so I just thank you, Lord, that you have not left us here alone, Lord. You've equipped us with everything we need to live a godly life through our knowledge of you, through your word, Lord. And so as we put your word in us, hide it in our heart, speak it and do it every single day, Lord. We're becoming more and more like you. We're refining ourselves. We're renewing our mind. We're not being conformed to the patterns of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our, of our minds through your word, Lord. And so I just thank you that anyone that chooses to put both hands on the plow and align themselves with your word and to put your word in their heart, Lord, you're going to meet them right where they are, Lord. You're gonna re- your Holy Spirit's going to reveal the plan that you have for them, Lord. And so we just thank you for that. We thank you that you have a plan for good, not evil, plans to prosper every single one of us, Lord. Every single one of us, you want us to come to know you more, Lord. You want us to come to know the plan you have for us. And you're not a respecter of persons, Lord. So anything that you would do for Bruce and Joe and Gina, you'll do for me, for every single person in here, Lord, that seeks you first, as Bruce Bruce mentioned, Lord. Seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us, Lord. And those things may not be what my flesh wants, but those things align with what your word has for me and your Holy Spirit. And that's all we need. That's all we need in this world, Lord, to truly accomplish your plan. And so I just I pray for the youth as well here today, Lord, not not just them, but everyone, but specifically for the youth. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that they true to buffet their uh, choose to buffet their bodies. Lord, they choose to get in your word before they go to school Lord. that they choose to walk in that love. They choose to overcome evil by doing good. They choose to respect their parents, Lord, to obey their parents. They choose to respect their authority figures, their teachers, Lord. They, they choose to listen while their teachers are teaching them, Lord. They choose to um, choose the higher path and not the lower path, the path of humility and not the path of pride, Lord, the path of purity, and not the path of the lust of their flesh and eyes, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that all the youth and all of us, Lord, truly choose that higher path, Lord, so we can grow that fruit that you want us to grow, Lord, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and that self-control, Lord. And so I just thank you again for all that you've done for us, all that you're doing, all that you're going to do, Lord. And we know as we stay on that narrow path, it's going to be good. Though we may have trials and troubles and tribulations in this world, Lord, you've delivered us from them all as we stand on your word and declare your word and don't declare how big the mountain is or how big the situation is or how much confusion the world or the enemy may be trying to put on us, but we declare your word, the solution, Lord. And as we do that, we're aligning ourselves to receive what you have, to receive that solution, Lord. We're unlocking the promises as we continue to declare your word, Lord. As it says in Psalm 85, 13, righteousness shall go before us and shall set us in the way of your footsteps. So as we walk uprightly in your word, doing all we know to do, Lord, we're walking right in your footsteps. And right where your footsteps are, that's where that blessing is. That's where that protection is. That's where the perseverance is. That's where the healing is. That's where the deliverance is. That's where the wholeness is, Lord, so that we'll be fully satisfied, content with everything you have for us, Lord. As we hunger and thirst for you, Lord, you fill us up, as it says in Matthew 5. And so we just thank you for that. Pray protection over us all, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that everything we need to accomplish your plan in our lives as we 
buffet our flesh and walk on that narrow path is coming to pass. It's coming to fruition. You're aligning those blessings and promises, Lord, as we continue to walk out the plan you have for us. Bring us back here to get together safely on Thursday night. I also pray for the nursing home ministry on Wednesday night, Lord, that that uh, your Holy Spirit moves. Your word as it's brought forth will bring great revelation, conviction, inspiration, and encouragement to everyone in attendance, Lord, so that they will truly hunger and thirst more and more for you and your word and that relationship with you to stay connected to the vine so that they will continue to grow that fruit as well. We love you, Lord. We trust in you, and we thank you for a great day and a great week in our lives. And as we come back together here Thursday night, Lord, I just pray that we'll have testimonies to share of what you've done in our lives, Lord, as we've buffeted our flesh, crucified our flesh, along with its passions, appetites, and desires, and truly walked um, in the light, Lord, as you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love y'all. Y'all have a great week.